to us about some lessons and early dead ends that you faced. Um, so a key lesson that I had to unlearn was the assumption that machine learning is always the best solution. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Humans in the Loop, our video series here at Human Managed. I'm Deborah, an intern at the Human Managed Singapore office. And today I am here with Shantris, our data scientist at the Manila Philippines office, here to talk to us about her journey um, as well as dive deep into fraud detection. Hi. It's so lovely to have you here with us. So what attracted you to human manage specifically? Because, um, you know, there's the tech industry is so saturated right now. Yeah. Um, there are so many opportunities for people with, you know, who are interested in data science. So what attracted you to HM specifically, given that it's, you know, a young company? I had a mentor and he, I was actually um, talking to him on whether I should pursue, like, continue it within the banking industry because I was previously in banking, like doing data analytics, data science for banking, or whether I should um, really pivot to tech. And yeah, I think he was like telling me that fraud is such a big problem today, um, as well as like, you know, digital transformation, but also keeping it secure. And um, human managed, like being... Um, a startup that really specializes in those kinds of use cases, it really attracted me towards it. And I did, like, I, I wasn't so familiar at that time about fraud or cybersecurity or how I can apply my data analytics and data science skills there. And that's um, knowing that it was something um, in demand as well as something that could really make a big impact, like it could protect people. Um, I wanted to learn how I can apply my skills there. And yeah, I guess that was the main factor that drew me to HM. Um, other than that, um, HM being a startup, I felt like I was going to be able to make um, a more tangible impact compared to being in a big company where things are much slower, where you don't really see a visible impact directly. So yeah, I think that was kind of also what drew me because I do like seeing an impact in what I do. Um, because it's just fulfilling and it motivates me to do even better. I think that's very inspirational, like saying that you are unfazed by startups because I, I know personally a lot of people who would think, oh, you know, startups, you know, you don't really know what's happening, but you took the risk and um, dare yeah. I say the risk paid off. Would, would you say the risk paid off? Yeah, it did. <laughs> I learned so, a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's really awesome. Um, I heard, um, I picked up that you mentioned fraud detection. Um, yeah. So kind of transitioning into more of a technical deep dive segment. Tell us more about uh, fraud in the context of machine learning. And so specifically, what did fraud or suspicious behavior look like before we intervened with the client? So since I worked within a bank for a while, I became like more familiar with like different protocols management would take to prevent fraud. Um, despite stringent processes like these, there's always going to be some slips or instances of misconduct that go unnoticed. And that's where human manage comes in to help investigate. So um, being a data company, all activities will always leave a digital footprint. And we see evidence of this in their data. What they really needed was support in investigating like complex, high-risk behaviors within their organization. So walk us through how we built it, like design and the technical decisions that we made, as well as how do you balance explaining it to the client versus the statistical rigor, since there's so much data, you want to be very, very precise. Yeah. Um, I'm assuming yeah. that sometimes you know, the people in the bank may not be, may not have this technical background. So yeah. presenting your findings to them is, you know, how, how do you navigate that? As a data scientist, so my work sort of goes beyond analytics. So I first process raw complex data sets into formats that are usable for analysis. So once that's prepared, I analyze employee activity to surface behavioral patterns. I then generate use cases that flag suspicious or policy violating behavior, such as employees performing functions that are not related to their roles. And most of our work supports fraud investigations, whether it's helping 
identify potential misconduct or providing analytics for confirmed fraud cases. Um, because we often don't have labeled data, we lean heavily on unsupervised learning techniques to detect anomalies. And the lack of ground truth makes it quite challenging, but it also makes it an interesting problem. Our models don't find fraud per se, but behaviors that statistically deviate from the mean. And one of our biggest challenges was balancing model complexity with explainability, especially for an audience like audit or compliance who may not be familiar with machine learning. So while we explored methods like SHAP value and feature importance, which are more or less really used for model explainability, um, they're harder to apply in unsupervised context. So instead, what I did was to rely on statistical visualizations, such as box plots and bar charts. And so this allowed me to sort of validate my findings and communicate to the client clearly. Okay, I can kind of follow that, especially because I know what a box plot is. So if yeah. you were presenting it to me, like I would understand that. Whereas if you told me, oh, uh, you know, some super techy thing and then unsupervised and supervised machine learning. Actually, I'm curious, what do you mean by supervised and unsupervised machine learning? So supervised learning is when you have a ground truth label. So for example, if you're planning to build a model that predicts fraudulent transaction. You need already a data set that have labeled data. So a data set where you already have confirmed fraud cases, and that's what you call our ground truth. So the model sort of learns from um, these labeled or past behaviors that are already confirmed. And yeah, it's much easier to, to train and to predict on unseen data. Um, on the other hand, unsupervised learning is sort of creating a model where you don't have any source of ground truth. So, for example, if you're not sure whether the data you're seeing is truly fraudulent fraudulent or not. So, usually the approach with in these um, situations is to use unsupervised learning. So, more of clustering algorithms, so grouping employees um, and behaviors into clusters or groups and identifying those employees whose activities deviate from the rest of the group. And those are who we flag as sort of um, suspicious and who we need to investigate further. So it's unconfirmed, but it gives us a good lead on where to start. Thank you for the explanation. I learned something new today. Um, so you mentioned that it's not necessarily confirm it just deviates from the norm based yes. on you know statistical exactly. analysis and so how do you differentiate between noise risk and actual fraud worthy behavior since you don't really have any set criteria i mean like a set rule for it so rather than simply relying on simple threshold based rules which tend to generate high false positives um, we focus on combinations of risk signals rather than isolated actions. Um, we also use historical baseline comparisons to distinguish between rare but legitimate behaviors and those that indicate potential misuse. Um, and this is these are all something machine learning models are particularly well suited for. Um, in addition, we incorporate feedback loops, which helps us continuously refine the model's understanding of what constitutes high priority versus benign behaviors. Okay, I see yeah. that that clears things up for me because I was like genuinely wondering how do you, um, since that you say it's unconfirmed, right? Then how do you like kind of pseudo confirm it in a sense? So how does this service that we provide? Um, change how bank teams think about risk today versus before? Previously, risk was seen largely in retrospective terms. So it was something uncovered after the damage was already done. But now um, with machine learning and forward-looking thinking, risk is proactively monitored with early indicators of intent or policy violations um, surfaced through behavior analytics. And this shift in approach maps directly to the intelligence decision action framework of human managed. So the intelligence comes from the insights generated by our models, flagging subtle complex behavioral patterns that would be nearly impossible to catch manually. 
The decision layer is powered by our ability to filter out noise and surface only the most relevant high-risk behaviors. And finally, the action is reflected in how the bank now responds. So more proactively rather than reactively, monitoring for early warning signs and intervening before small anomalies escalate into more serious issues. And so what was once a retrospective process has now evolved into a dynamic data-driven strategy that empowers fraud teams to anticipate and prevent threats and not just respond to them. It shows the impact that we have, right? Because there are a lot, you might think like, oh, they can just do on their own, but give, yeah. thank, thank you for elaborating on the idea model that we have, because I think it gives audiences a much better idea of what uh, standards we follow when providing services for clients and what really sets us apart, because I'm sure there are other companies trying to do the same thing. There are other platforms trying to do the same thing. And for us, the idea platform is a very unique in-house built kind of framework for fraud detection for cybersecurity. Um, so in every project and in every use case, I mean, you're very, very brilliant, but I'm sure there were some harms along the way. So talk to us about some lessons and early dead ends that you face. Um, so a key lesson that I had to unlearn was the assumption that machine learning is always the best solution. But in reality, the best approach actually depends on the business context. So sometimes simple rule-based methods are more appropriate, especially when interpretability and speed are crucial. And trying to use complex models where a straightforward logic could suffice can create unnecessary confusion. Um, especially in sensitive areas like fraud detection. That's actually a really interesting insight because now with all the hype about AI and machine learning, I think a lot of people want to just think that it can solve all their problems, which yeah. technically, theoretically, it can. Theoretically, yeah, that's but true. Sometimes, <laughs> but sometimes throwing AI at it, that. <laughs> yeah, throwing machine learning at it may not necessarily be the most uh, effective way of um, forward for your specific circumstances. So I think it's very important to keep these conditions in mind. You know, there are nuances to each use case. Yeah. Uh, machine learning, like you said, machine learning isn't always the best way, but I wouldn't have considered that because as somebody who is not, um, doesn't have a tech background to me, it's like, oh, machine learning, AI, very cool, very good, you know, so I wouldn't, yeah. so thank you for sharing that because I wouldn't have thought of that on my own. Um, and I think it's very interesting for the audiences to hear that, that actually machine learning for all its um, pros also has some cons in certain contexts. So this fraud use case uh, detection platform, I guess you could say, um, I'm sure this wasn't built by one person. So who else shaped this journey with you and what made this collaboration work? This truly was like a team effort. So my fellow data architects, data engineers, and front-end developers played a vital role in bringing the solution to life. So without them, the insights I uncovered would remain confined within a Jupyter notebook. They're the ones who built the robust data pipelines I work with and created the front-end interface that allow our clients to clearly understand and act on the results. And what made the collaboration work was not just proactive communication, but really a strong sense of mutual understanding. So, for example, the front-end team really needed to grasp the purpose and value of the insights I was generating so they could design meaningful and intuitive visualizations. And at the same time, the data engineers and architects had to understand my input requirements, my dependencies, and outputs to be able to orchestrate a seamless end-to-end -end workflow. And that shared context and the willingness to bridge technical and business perspectives was what truly made the collaboration work. What advice would you give to somebody who is trying to build meaningful data services and not just dashboards with numbers on it? So one of the biggest pieces of advice I'd offer is to not underestimate the power of a feedback loop, especially the human kind. And while it's true that machine learning models can be designed with automated feedback mechanisms and continuous learning capabilities, these systems still rely on human insight and context to stay grounded and meaningful. This is particularly true in domains like fraud de detection, where attackers' behaviors is not only constantly evolving, but also highly nuanced and situational. So a model that performs well today can quickly become obsolete if it's not challenged, interpreted, and adapted based on what investigators and, and, and analysts are actually seeing on the ground. 
And human feedback brings perspective, judgment, and real-world experiences, some things that algorithms can't replicate. And it helps us refine features, redefine what constitutes a risky pattern, and prioritize what matters most operationally. Um, in short, continuous learning isn't just about machines learning from data. It's also about people and systems learning together. And also, another thing is to focus on creating data services that drive decisions, not just visualization. So a dashboard is only as useful as the action it can enable. You can ask yourself, does this help the end user do their job better, faster or more confidently? And if the answer is yes, then that means you're on the right track. That's, I think that's very encouraging for those who are you know, either studying data science or trying to build certain platforms. Hearing it from somebody like you who's been through it, who's built something so effective, I think is very good advice. Given all that you've shared, you know, the lessons you've learned, the skills that you've used to build this platform, as well as the principles that you go off when applying these things to specific use cases, where else outside of fraud could your same approach be useful? So the same behavioral analytics approach we use for fraud can also be extended to marketing, customer engagement, and service optimization. So for example, by identifying clusters of customer behaviors, we could tailor engagement strategies like targeted product offers or churn prevention campaigns based on how clients actually interact with the bank services. Um, it could also help identify operational inefficiencies or service bottlenecks, flag high value clients showing signs of disengagement, or even optimize um, onboarding flows based on customer behavior patterns. So the core idea is to repurpose anomaly detection and clustering models to understand not just risky behaviors, but any kind of behavior that deviates from the desired pattern, whether it's in fraud, missed opportunity, or loss of engagement. So thank you for walking us through a fraud use case, how you use fraud detection um, for actual clients talking to us about what fraud detection actually is. Um, so thank you for making time to talk to me today. I know you're on a very, very tight schedule. Um, <laughs> thank you for taking time out of your day to have a chat with me. I really um, appreciate it. And I'm sure our audience appreciates it too. So thank you so much and have a good rest of your day. And to our audience, if you watch all the way to here, thank you very much. Um, stay tuned for future episodes and we will have more interesting guests from our offices around the world. So just stay tuned for that. Um, bye, guys. Bye.